we're live. Hey guys, it's good to be back with you. It's been a long time since we've been here on Sunday night. And uh, we're going to be working on a Bible study called Embracing Spiritual Maturity for the next week or two, or maybe even three. I haven't decided yet. Um, because one of the things that we, we talked about this morning in church, that the church does a horrible job today of discipling people. Terrible, terrible job of discipling people. Um, too many churches tell people what they want to hear. Too many people mistake what the Bible says and say that it's something else. Um, and there's just not a lot of good biblical understanding in the world today. That's why we can have a president who says he's a Christian who is pro-abortion all the way up to the baby being born. Uh, and other people who say things that just blow your mind when they, when they relate something to God. So how do you talk to that person? How do you explain to somebody? Uh, that what they may be thinking is incorrect. And you have to know what you believe, and you have to know why you believe it, and you have to know how to help them understand it. And you also have to have this piece. You're not the Holy Spirit. You can't convince them, but God calls us to help people understand why. So tonight, I thought I would start off, I'm not giving you a paper yet. I thought I would start off by having you tell me what spiritual maturity is. What is spiritual maturity? We say everybody should become spiritually mature. What is spiritual maturity? What is it? Nobody has an answer for me? Knowing the Bible? Knowing the Scripture? But, in order to know the scripture, you have to read the scripture, study the scripture, and that horrible, nasty word, memorize. Yeah. Scripture, that's all part of becoming spiritually mature. Yeah. Right? If you, you can never go be spiritually mature if what you do sit on Sunday morning and listen to what whoever's in the front says. Never. So how do we help you here at Cumberland Community Church in that respect? I give you something every time we're here so that you can follow along. It's up on the screen where you can see it on Sunday morning. So you can, And the blanks are not filled in. That makes you have to participate. Because it's a participatory thing. It's not like Carmack the uh, Magnificent, if anybody remembers Johnny Carson. When Johnny Carson used to take the envelope and put it up to his turban on Johnny Carson's show, and, and uh, he would say an answer, and he would open the answer up, and the question would be some stupid question that went along with the answer. God didn't just pour it in your head. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, we had somebody come out here, probably been six months ago, eight months ago, um, to the food or clothing pantry, and it was a grandma raising her grandkids because the dad was all messed up and she wanted some Bibles. And I said, okay, I'll find you some Bibles. I went around, found a couple Bibles, brought them over to her. And she handed them to the kids and said, now you put these under your pillow, they'll keep you safe at night. Hmm. Is that what the Bible's for? Hmm. If you lay your head on a pillow with a Bible under it, does it just come into your ear and out through your brain and, and, and go where it's supposed to? No, you don't. Something else about spiritual maturity. Tell me something else about spiritual maturity. What you know about spiritual maturity. I think when a person knows for a certainty, uh, through reading the Word of God, all those things, where you stand with the Lord and, and what's expected of you. And okay, you know what's expected of you. How do you know that, though? Uh, how, do you know, how do you know what's expected of you? How does anybody in this room know what's expected of them? That and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, if you understand Scripture, you have the first steps to understanding what is required of you for spiritual maturity, for salvation and spiritual maturity. You know, Romans 10, 9 and 10 through 13 says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. 
For it's by believing in your heart and confessing that you are saved. And But it also says, how can... Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How can they hear or have to come to God if they, that they don't hear if nobody tells them, right? So if we look at that, people have to know a certain amount of scripture just to have Christ as their Savior, okay? But here's the problem. Most people just want somebody to tell them what's expected of them to become spiritually mature. And I hope that's not why you came to this Bible study. Because... You need to know what's expected of you. And if you really want to know, I'll give you the answer to that question right there. Jesus said, you be holy because I'm holy. God said, you be holy because I'm holy. And that's a full, long, deep understanding of what it means to be like Christ. Okay, what else is another part of spiritual maturity? Because you behave in a certain way. Okay. Actions. The way you behave, the way you react to certain things, okay, and a willingness to do it God's way. See, a lot of people, when they think they become Christians, they start changing their behaviors. You can change all the behavior in the world you want, but if you don't have Jesus, you don't have Jesus. Amen. Right? You can, you can look like it, act like it, and talk like it, but if it's not real, it's not real. And so, there are a lot of people out there who don't have Jesus Christ who have better actions in their lives than what people who call themselves Christians do. There are actually some people out there who aren't believers who behave better than some people who call themselves Christians there are people out there who are not Christians who react more positively and more, you know, graciously, more friendly than people who call themselves Christians. And there are people out there who think they're doing it God's way, but you can't do it God's way unless you belong to Christ. Just like we read this morning in Romans, there's none righteous, no, not one. And that is apart from our relationship with Jesus Christ. So, spiritual maturity also... Un involves understanding. Doesn't it? Spiritual maturity involves sacrifice. Spiritual maturity involves service or servitude. But again, as we look down these lines and we look what's here, there are a lot of people that don't belong to Jesus and they know scripture, they read it, they study it, they even memorize it, and they know how to use it against somebody who is a believer in Christ. There are people out there who know what's expected of them. There are people out there who do all these things we just talked about. There are people out there who have way more understanding than the common person does sitting in a church pew because they did the work. There are people out there who are willing to sacrifice for somebody else who has a hard time going in life than some Christians will, quote unquote Christians. And there are other people out there who think that they're making their way to where God wants them to be by working, serving, trying to get there. Does that make sense to everybody? All these things could be done by an unbeliever. So what's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever? What's the difference between somebody who's moving towards spiritual maturity and somebody who's just out there maybe waiting to catch you in their little trap, their little scripture trap, where they say, well, I was reading this scripture the other day, and that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Why don't you tell me what it means? Or why does this contradict that? Or whatever, something like that. Or, you know, how come your church doesn't help people do this, this, and this, when everybody else will help people do this, this, and this? You know, there's always somebody out there looking to catch us in a trap. And one of the things that's part of spiritual maturity is not letting yourself get caught. Okay? There are certain things that you can say, like, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out. You know, you might be right. Let's check into it. And there's another thing there. You have, you have had a certain amount of understanding on your road to spiritual maturity. And hopefully, as you're becoming more spiritually mature, your understanding grows. Because you never are satisfied Amen. with 
what you understand. So you don't ever get there. You don't arrive. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Always learning. Always hungry. Always wanting to know more. Sacrifice. You know, we, we talk about sacrifice, but we really don't know what sacrifice is. We don't. Um, and servanthood. Right now, in the church in America, 5% of the people do 95% of everything that gets done in the church. Or for the church or with the church. 5%. Used to be 10% dropped. drops. And so, as we think about these things, we all come up short somewhere on this. And we have two choices. We can either say, well, I guess I'm done. I can't memorize anything. I don't like to read. Never did like school, so I don't like to study. I can't understand what the Bible says, so we don't read. Um, that's why there's so many people out there who end up in cults and stuff like that, because somebody comes along and starts telling them something that sounds maybe a little bit like they heard somewhere in the church somewhere, and they think they're Christians too, and they fall right in. There are other people who read the Scripture, and they say, well, that's not for me, because I know who I am, and the Bible doesn't tell me who I am. I'm just trying to read it and understand it. But if you don't read it and understand it, then you don't even know who you are. Does that make sense? So as we look at this, it's a, it's a very complicated process of spiritual maturity. Let's just take it and liken it to um, a child becoming mature. Okay, when a baby's first born, I just saw a picture of a brand new baby, right? He's eating steak already, right? <laughs> Up walking around, climbing the curtains, driving a car. No. Everybody starts at zero. And then you learn. You learn from the people around you. You learn from what's done for you. Eventually you become able to do things for yourself. And as soon as you can do something for yourself, you rebel against whoever's trying to show you what to do. That's like when you're feeding a kid and they're grabbing at the spoon. They want to put the spoon in their mouth. They want to put the food in there, right? And they get it everywhere but in their mouth. And then they get a little older and you tell them not to touch something and they touch it and they start crying because they got hurt or burned. They learn by bump and error, by, you know, this happens and that happens and things like that. Sad to say, that's the way it works in our spiritual walk sometimes. If we don't have somebody who's guiding us, helping us, or if we don't have the, this is what it also takes. It takes determination above everything else. And by determination, I mean, even on the days when I don't feel like it and I don't want to, I'm still going to. Okay? But what do we do? We get lazy. We get comfortable. How many of you, if you walked in your house with somebody else's eyes, would see something different than what you see with your own eyes? We become house blind. You know what house blind means? It means that piece of paper has been laying there for a week. And we walk by it until we don't even see it anymore. Right? And for... You sit down at just the right angle when the sun's shining through the dining room window and you look over under the buffet and it's not a dust bunny, it is a mountain lion sitting under there. And if it had teeth and a mouth, it would growl at you because the dust moth didn't get under there yet. But we don't see those things. We become blind to them. And when we're walking with God, sometimes we skip the spiritual maturity part and we're not determined enough to work at all these things that we're talking about here. And we become house blind to what's in our own lives and then we begin to say, well, I'm not bad, I'm, not, I'm okay, I'm good with God, like we talked about this morning. No, no, we're not. Um, there's always room for improvement, always room to grow. All right, take these, I hope we got enough. Take these, pass them around, and we'll start on the paperwork part of it now. Participatory thing, okay? I may call on you. Because I'm not going to do all the talking. Now, based on this little bit of background material that we have here, and I'm not going to ask you to respond to this out loud, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but based on what we've just put on this little bit of a board right here, I want you to stop and take two minutes and think of how you have embraced spiritual maturity. 
Well, look at me. How have you in your own life embraced spiritual maturity? How have you embraced Scripture? There's another one we left off here, a very important one. Isn't it? The more we mature, the more different our prayers become. We move past, now I lay me down to sleep. God bless everybody in the world to a real prayer life. And if you don't have a real prayer life, and you don't know Scripture, and you're not gaining understanding or desiring and determined to be understanding, and to sacrifice for the cause of Christ and to serve other people and to serve God, I would say you don't know what's expected of you, therefore you may not be a believer in Christ. Anybody. I don't care who they are. I'm not just talking about us in this room. I'm talking about everybody. Because every one of these things is involved in being a Christian isn't it? and being a, follow, a true follower of Christ. And there are too many fake followers of Christ out there in the world today. Some people have adopted Christianity as a lifestyle. That doesn't happen very much anymore. That happened in the 50s and the 60s. People just thought Christianity was a better option, so they became Christians, quote-unquote. And then in the 60s and the 70s, their kids all began to rebel because they looked at their parents' fake Christianity, and they didn't want any part of it. They didn't want to be hypocrites. And so, since the ones who just adopted Christianity as a lifestyle, have kids who now reject their lifestyle. They're not teaching their kids about Jesus. And then the grandkids aren't being taught about Jesus. And the great-grandkids aren't being taught about Jesus. And here we are in the world that we live in today, where a man can sue a hospital for not giving him a hysterectomy and get a million bucks. You see, when you lose spiritual maturity and people aren't out there standing up for God and believing what the Bible says and helping other people understand what the Bible says, you move to the twilight zone because everything else people believe is right. And then they'll turn around and say, this is all wrong. This is all bad. This is all backwards. This is all evil. And we should silence this because we want to hear that. And it goes right back to Genesis chapter 3. Eve didn't want to hear, you can't eat that. She wanted to hear, go ahead and eat it, you won't die. And that what's going on in our world today? And that's what's going on in the churches in America today, too. It is. Um, let's, let's look at this. The church does a pitiful job of discipleship. Too many people have been talked into believing that they're saved when they may not be. I get sick of watching Franklin Graham get on the TV or... Um, the guy from Calvary Chapel in California, can't think of his name right off the top of my head. When they get on there and they say, repeat these words after me, now you're saved. No, no. The true mark of salvation is to believe in Jesus Christ. But in order to do that, you have to repent of your sins. And, you have, and there's more to believe in than just hearing. Hearing is belief or faith is seeing, experiencing after you've heard. Okay. So they're giving people false hope. They're giving people false understanding of what it truly means to have a relationship with Christ. They never talk about change your behavior. They don't ever talk about know what God expects from you. They don't ever talk about reading the scripture, studying it, and understanding it. They just say, now you're a Christian, you're good. That's not true. And that's why we have such a shallow group of leadership in the church in America today. Shallow. I mean, in most churches, if the pastor's gone, there's nobody else to do what the pastor does. Okay? It used to be there would be two or three guys who would be ready and willing to stand up and speak. It used to be to call anybody up and ask them to pray, and they would pray. Um, in front of people, oh my gosh. Right? And when we have our kids challenge people to memorize scripture, they don't want to be picked. Why? Why not? Well, they receive nothing more than basic training and often fall by the wayside as sinfulness becomes their reality again. Most people today will contemplate somebody telling them about Jesus when they're in the midst of a crisis that's so big that they can't possibly handle it. They want to hear something. But they want to hear it the way they want to hear it. 
And then, if God does get involved in their life somehow, and they have a warm fuzzy with God for a little while, if nobody's there to help them move or to make the true decision to follow Christ and then move into becoming a disciple of Christ, they fall back away by the wayside. They do. They absolutely do. Um, you know, Jesus said those who truly belong to him will never fall away from him. Never. Peter tells us, work hard to prove that you're of the faith so that you won't fall away. And I'll tell you what spiritual maturity is. It's a big old dose of hard work that nobody wants to do. They don't carry their Bibles to church. They don't read their Bible. They, they want they, they want to come in and sit down two seconds before it starts or ten minutes after and leave before everybody's gone or before everybody gets up. And so as we look at this, Somebody quote a scripture for me, if you would. Somebody got one memorized? I mean, every kid that's ever been to church has memorized the scripture. Somebody give me a scripture. I know Proverbs 4 6. All right. Do not be anxious about anything. Tell God what you need. Do not be anxious for anything. Tell God. Okay. Don't be anxious about anything. Yeah. Pray about everything. Okay. Somebody else. You got the gist of it, and you know where it is. So if you say, I'm going to tell you what the scripture says, you can always go to it. Because everybody's computer that they carry in their pocket has a Bible on it if you want to put it on there. Right? Somebody else. Give me a scripture that you've memorized. Here's a good one to start with. Psalm 119.11. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay? 1 Corinthians 10.13. There's no temptation come upon you, but such as is common to man. With every temptation, God provides a way out. Okay? We need to know God's word because those are the words that help us in the times that are difficult. Because we know who God is. We know what God wants. You know, when you talk to somebody who believes that Jesus is not God, John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's no question mark there. And so, as we think about God's Word, and we understand what God's Word says, it helps us in all these different areas of our lives. But there are a lot of people out there who get talked into believing that they're a believer when they're not. Because a true believer doesn't do the opposite of what God wants. Okay? That makes sense? A true believer is hungry to know what God wants. A true believer really wants to be the person that God's called them to be. That's what a true believer looks like. And somebody who's a true believer is hungry to be spiritually mature. I mean, let's just think about it, guys. If we were going to have a dinner here at the church and everybody came in thinking it was going to be catered, right? Not like the great one we had just two weeks ago where everybody bought such a mass amount of awesome, amazing food. Um, everybody comes in, sits down, and then we have a trained staff that comes in and they've got everything under a cloche. And when they come to your table, they take the cloche off and they set a baby bottle in front of everybody. Bull milk. And that's... And then they put a little spoonful of Cheerios on a plate beside you. And a bottle of baby food. And that's the dinner that you paid $35 for to have a dinner at the church. How many people do you think would give a bad review on that? But do you know churches all across America are just feeding people baby food because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 that most of the people who've heard it have heard it enough times and they're around it long enough that they ought to be teachers. But they still need the basics because they've never been determined to become or embrace spiritual maturity. It is, I mean, look how Jesus picked to follow them. Uneducated fishermen, tax collectors. One guy was a religious zealot. You know, um, they, they weren't the, the top crop. They weren't the top drawer. They weren't the PhDs and, and all those people. They were regular people. And Peter stood up and quoted scripture right out of the Old Testament. How did that happen when you're, old, when you're just a dumb old fisherman? But you know what? I know people who don't have a college education who've memorized books out of the Bible. 
memorize entire books out of the Bible. Think about that for a minute. Wouldn't it be nice if you had just a little Rolodex inside your head where you could go to a certain few scriptures that really make a difference in people's lives? 1 John 5. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. I've written these things that you might know that you have life. 1 John 5, 12 and 13, I think it is. 11, 12, 12 and 13, somewhere around there. Wouldn't it be great to be able to pull those things out of your mind? You know, some people start later in life as Christians and they don't have the benefit. And some people, sadly, if they're if they go to church from the time they're a little kid until they're old people, they don't get enough opportunity to memorize scripture or take the opportunity. Um, again, God just doesn't stomp on your foot so the top of your head pops open and he just pours a bucket of what he wants you to know in there and slam the lid down and expect you to just puke it out. That's not what he wants. He wants you to chase after him. And then we look at the Bible tells us that we should seek, seek God's righteousness above all else. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Okay? Now, Jesus has just been talking about, don't worry about what you're going to eat today, don't worry about what you're going to wear today, don't worry about people who persecute you and all those kind of things. And he says, seek first the kingdom of God, and you'll get everything that God has for you. Well, I'll show you how it's been mistreated and mistaught. I was listening to something that Kenneth Copeland was teaching the other day. And Kenneth Copeland talked about the fact that when he and his wife first got married, they were young and they lived in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, and uh, he said, we read that scripture together and it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And they both said, well, we need things. And that's been the entirety of their ministry ever since they've been quote-unquote doing ministry, is helping people figure out that things are so important that you have to harass God for things. And that God is only going to give you things. And if you give them enough money, God will give you things. It's not that you need things. It's not physical, tangible things. It's God will take care of you. God will watch over you. God will give you the desires of your heart as long as they line up with His will. That's the part they leave out right there. And so... If we're going to be spiritually mature, we got to seek the things of God, His righteousness. Okay? And God is righteous. There's no sin in Him. In order for us to be righteous, we have to become more like Christ. How do we know how to become more like Christ? We have to read Scripture, study the Scripture, memorize the Scripture. We have to know what it looks like to be like Christ. We have to modify our life by the Holy Spirit working in us and giving us a willing to do it God's way. We have to seek further understanding and never be satisfied that we've already arrived. We have to be willing to sacrifice even as Jesus sacrificed. Same thing in marriage. It says, husbands love your wives the way Christ loved the church in Ephesians chapter 5. He laid down his life for his church, for his bride. And then Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And to seek and save, that's what's lost. And every time we see Jesus getting away from people, he's not getting away from people for any other reason than to go and pray and spend time with his Father. So, if we want the same kind of righteousness that Jesus has, we have to be determined to not let anything take us off track. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to pray, if you don't want anybody around, if you go find the quietest place in the house, or outside, or in your man cave, or she shed, or whatever you got. And you go, and you sit down, and you bow your head and start praying. You will hear the sink dripping on the other side of the neighbor's house. You'll hear the dog barking three ridges over. You'll hear a mouse sparting and scratching in the paper in the corner where you don't, didn't catch him the last time. And you'll hear your heart going, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, and you'll have your ears going, Bruh! You've got to be determined to overcome all that stuff to be able to be who God wants you to be. And see, we're very easily, very easily sidetracked. It doesn't take much. Um, so how do we know what this entails if nobody teaches us its importance? How do we know? It amazes me. And I don't say this to puff myself up. But I cannot tell you the number of people who come to Cumberland Community Church who have either been in church for a while or been in church all their lives who have actually testified to the fact either on a radio program or in a sermon, sitting in a sermon or 
just in front of everybody, that they learned more in the first few months or the first year that they were coming to the community church than they did in their whole life at every other church they went to. How is that possible? How can a church teach somebody for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and they still don't know anything? How is that possible? Here's how it's possible. There's an assumption that everybody understands. That's why once in a while, you'll hear me give the um, Jackie Chan and not Chris, whatever his name was, conversation. Did you just understand the words that came out of my mouth? Because we shouldn't assume that anybody is already a believer. We shouldn't assume that anybody knows everything we're talking about. And a lot of churches, they don't bring it down to where a level where people can understand it. And they use a lot of sacrosanct religious terminology. They want to use the technical terms from theology to talk about the Holy Spirit. So they talk about pneumatology. You know, the unchangeableness of God is the immutability of God. And they want to dazzle people with their knowledge. But what you do when you dazzle people with your knowledge is you leave them standing behind saying, what the world did he just say? And they walk out of the church saying, what in the world did we just do? Why do I waste my time there? So they don't want to be mature. They don't want to grow. Um, and you know, there was a time where everybody read a, um, and I, don't, I still read it, the King James Version, and I, I don't knock it, it it's, it's for who's for but there was a time in the world where everybody said, that's the one you have to read, and you've got to understand it. Well, in order to sit down and truly read the, the King James Version and understand it, you have to have a King James Bible, you have to have a concordance, you have to have a lexicon so that you know what the words mean, some of the words that you don't even know what they mean. And that's like, nobody's going to get sit down, not many people put it that way, are going to sit down and do that. But if you can sit and read God's Word in conversational language that you understand, you're going to, make, you're going to, you're going to read it. Now, again, I said this in the Bible study not too long ago. Most of the scripture that I remember has come from the King James Version. That's why I grew up. But I found that the less and less people were exposed to church and the less and less they understood about the Bible, the less chance was those people were going to read that and understand it. Plus, again, jokingly, if you think my sermons are long now, I have to explain everything to you. As I read it to you, King James is going to make a sermon twice as long as your butt really going to be sore before you get out of the chair and walk out of here on Sunday morning. It's great. It's the easiest one, it's the easiest one in the world to memorize. I mean, if you want to really learn how to memorize scripture, memorize it in King James. Because it's written in meter and verse. Okay? It doesn't have a lot of the conjunctions and things like that and the extra wording that some of it does. But, what I'm saying is in our world today, people who are biblically illiterate are not going to pick up the King James Bible and start reading it. They're not going to pick up the New American Standard and start reading it because it's a little bit wooden. They're going to get an NIV, which in my opinion is too wordy, or they're going to get something else that's a modern translation that they could read and understand. And that's the amazing thing. When the Bible was written, it was written so you could understand it. The common person could understand it. It was written in Koine Greek. That's everyday Greek. And our language and everyday language is what we ought to be reading the Bible in. Correct? Until we get the one that comes out and says, you know, Yo, Jesus, what's up, man? You know, I'm not reading that. I'm not. And the one that comes up and talks about the fact that the scripture I read this morning doesn't count. When I read the one from Ephesians chapter 2 that talks about who's not going to get into heaven. Um, you know, we need to know that kind of stuff. When people are participating in behaviors, we need to be able to take them to the scripture and show them Ephesians chapter 2. Or 1 Corinthians 6, through, uh, 1 Corinthians 6 9 to 10. Uh, where it talks about the fact that homosexuals and sexually and, you know, idolaters and greedy people and all. They're not going to get into heaven. But then verse 10 comes along and says, some of you were like that, which means there has to be a transformation, a transition. Somebody finds out who Jesus is. Their life changes. They want to become like Christ. They don't want to be the person they used to be. And that's how you know salvation has really occurred in somebody's life in the first place. They're saved, and they don't want to go back to being who they were. But people who are talked into believing that they're saved that don't understand what even salvation is, that's easy for them to fall back to doing what they were doing, or maybe even worse. Okay, if we, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, we're going to look at that, and we're going to run down through this real quick. I don't want to keep you way late tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 11 through 16. 
tells you what my responsibility is, okay? My responsibility, and a lot of pastors, quote unquote, preacher types, people who stand in the position that I do, they don't take this very seriously. Um, and they also don't realize when they're, miste- when they're teaching things that are wrong, like that example I gave the Copelands a while ago, they don't understand that one day they're going to have to stand in front of God and give an account for that because this, the, not many of us should become teachers because we're held to a more severe and strict punishment from God. Well, I don't want to be punished from God. I don't know everything. I'm not a walking computer. But I want to help people understand what God's Word says, and it's easy to do that, right? So, as we look at this, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, I'm going to read it real quick. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Well, I can tell you right now, there's no reason for apostles or prophets in the church ever to be accountable anymore. But, well, you know what the fastest growing group of people in leadership in the church is? Apostles and prophets. There are no apostles anymore. Paul and John were the last two apostles. That's it. Okay? We don't need prophets anymore because the prophecy's in the book. So anybody that's out there saying that they're an apostle or being acclaimed as an apostle, then people don't have a clue what they're talking about. Because an apostle had to have a face-to-face interaction with Jesus Christ, and they were given their assignment by Christ himself. Period. Okay? And we don't need prophets because all the prophets who spoke in the Old Testament, pretty much what they said has been fulfilled, and all the prophecies that are left over from the Old Testament and all of them from the New Testament will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we don't need to know any of that other stuff. But look what's left. Evangelist. What's an evangelist? What's an evangelist? Everybody that's sitting around this room that belongs to Jesus Christ falls into the category of an evangelist. That's simply somebody who goes and shares the good news with lost people. Helps them understand why they need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That should be all of us. Pastors and teachers, okay? Their responsibility, my responsibility, is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. You hear that? My job is to equip people to do His work. And to equip them to build up, or for, and to help build up the body of Christ. To equip somebody, they have to be have a determination, and they have to want to be equipped. Does that make sense? You can't make some. You can't get somebody to do something they don't want to do. You can't. And if they do it, they're not doing it for the right reason. So that's why I don't manipulate people. You know, I look at, if somebody leaves our church. And I know that there's no problem that really is an issue, or they may be, you know, they misunderstood and, and they're not willing to talk about it. I don't chase people down. I look at it this way. Adult people make adult decisions, and adult people should live with their adult decisions. Right? Because if I go out and beg somebody to come back, and I just, you know, slobber all over them and tell them how great they are and we need them, that is manipulation. And they're not coming back for the right reason. And here's my idea. You can serve Christ wherever you are. But if you're in a church where they're not teaching the gospel and they're not teaching discipleship and they're not talking about the Bible, you should run as fast as you can and get away from that. Nobody can ever say that we don't disciple people here, that we don't teach God's Word, that we compromise on God's Word. Nobody can ever say that. But I've had people leave this church accusing me of being a heretic because I taught the simple truth of God's Word and disagreed with what they said and what they like. So, you know, people are going to make their own mind up. But my job, hard as it is, is to equip God's people. And you know what? It says God's people. I can't equip somebody that doesn't belong to Jesus to do anything. Does that make sense? I'm not the Holy Spirit. I can't, I can't convict anybody to do it. Only the Holy Spirit can convict people to do stuff. And to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. Do you hear the progression? People come to Christ, somebody teaches them about Christ, they become part of the functioning body of believers, and then we all are on the process of moving towards the same purpose. That's why everybody who becomes a member here goes through a membership class. Because we need everybody to understand why we do what we do. Because if we have 80 or 90 people who are members and they want to do all their own thing, we're never going to get anywhere. You know, it's like on your car. 
When you put it in drive, which way do you expect it to go? Hmm? Well, what if you put it in drive and the left wheel wants to go left and the right wheel wants to go right and the back wheel wants to go back to the right and the other back wheel just wants to go straight back? What happens? Are you going anywhere? No, you're not going anywhere. You see, when we are maturing spiritually, we all have the same goal. And the goal that we have is to be who God wants us to be so that we can serve Him and sacrifice for Him as we're learning so that we can help other people see what that looks like and walk with them as they're doing the same thing. Okay? That's the way it works. And that's my job is to help everybody understand that. It also says here, this will continue till we all come to such unity of our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. If we don't know what's expected of us, we'll never get there. How many of you have ever shot a gun before? Anybody? If you don't aim at the target, you'll miss it every time. <laughs> Won't you? If you don't aim at it, you'll miss it every time. So we all need to know what the goal is. What is the goal? To become like Christ. And to help as many people as we can find a relationship with Jesus Christ so that they don't have to spend eternity separated from God in hell. Okay, that's what we're supposed to do. Now, you maybe have already tried to do that, and most of you, I'm sure, have tried to talk to somebody about something that has to do with your relationship with God or them having a relationship with God. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a little night, Sunday night Bible study like this called Sharing Your Faith Without Fear. I'm going to teach you how to talk to people about Jesus. How about that? And it shouldn't cause a fight. Okay? Um, but you heard me say this morning, if you were here, that I'm in an ongoing conversation with a bunch of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who all have the same post office box in LaVale, and every letter I get from them comes from the same post office box, but every one of them comes from somebody different, and I'm trying to help them understand why what they believe is not the, tr not the truth and not correct. But they've been so brainwashed into believing what they believe that they won't hear the truth. Okay? But you know, there are a lot of people in our world and a lot of people in our lives that have been brainwashed into believing that what they're doing is okay because everybody else is doing it. Um, and so as we read a little further down here, it says, the reason we're doing this, then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching we won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Do you know that these TV preachers like Stephen Furtick and, jo uh, and Joyce Meyer and Benny Hinn and, and uh, what's his name? Can't think of his name. Big black guy with a little beard. Um, can't think of his name. Uh, they, they all twist the scriptures just enough to where it still sounds like God's word. But it's teaching you something that's very harmful. Stephen Furtick believes that he doesn't really believe in the Trinity. He, uh, he's a oneness Pentecostal guy. Now, he started out as, quote, unquote, a Southern Baptist, but now he's a oneness Pentecostal. He believes in modalism. God was the Father in the Old Testament, then he became Jesus, then he became the Holy Spirit, and they worship the Holy Spirit to the exclusion of the Father and the Son. And as we, you know, as we, Frederick Price, that's his name, um, as we look at some of these other people that teach out there, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer, Benny Hinn, a lot of those people in the faith movement teach that Jesus went to hell and was tortured by Satan so you wouldn't have to be. Is that what the Bible says? No, it says that he breathed out his last, he said it's finished, they stuck the spirit aside, they took his body off the cross, they put it in the ground, three days later he rose from the dead, doesn't say anything in there about him going to the devil or going to hell or being tortured by the devil so that you wouldn't have to be. So you've got people out there that are teaching stuff that people are like, wow, I never heard it like that before because it doesn't exist. That's why you never heard it like that before. Now, finishing up here and then we'll go back and unpack it. Uh, instead, we'll speak the truth in love. That's hard to do. Growing in every way more and more like Christ who is the head of his body in the church he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. 
You see, if we're not serving and sacrificing, the body suffers. That make sense? If you have a body part that doesn't work, your whole body knows that body part didn't work. Correct? Yeah. If you twist your knee, if you stub your toe, if you sleep on your own, on your arm the wrong way at night, you end up with a stiff neck, or you got your head all, head all jacked up on a pillow, and you wake up in the morning, you walk down to get your coffee like this, because you can't make your head go like this, your whole body knows it. Doesn't it? And when the body of Christ is not healthy, the whole body's affected. When one part of the body of Christ is not healthy, the whole body's affected. When everybody's doing this stuff, God's body ought to be growing, it ought to be vibrant, it ought to be something everybody wants to be a part of. And I can tell you, I've been to some churches that have been dead so long that dead is a, is a, normal, a normal reality for them. They wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if they came in the room and lit a fire in the building. They wouldn't. Because they just accepted that what they do and what they know is all they need to do and all they need to know. And that will never work. All right, let's look at this. Verse 11 to 12. Leadership in the church is to equip God's people. That's to build up the church and to make the body healthy, strong and healthy. Okay, those are the two blanks. Equip and healthy. Verses 13 through 15. Those being taught have responsibilities. Okay? I'm not the hired gun. I'm not the hired holy man. I don't have to answer to God for what you do. I have to answer to God for what I do and how I taught or what didn't I, how I didn't teach. You have responsibility to answer God. And here are the things. I'll run down through them. To be unified in faith. There are two beliefs out there about salvation. One group of people believes that you can never lose your faith because of what Jesus said in Matthew or John 6 and, and what John says in John, 1 John chapter 5 um, that we said already um, about he who has a son has life. Jesus said, nobody comes to me lest they're drawn by the Father and those the Father gives me I'll not lose one or raise one last day. Other people think you can lose your salvation. Okay. <clears throat> I say that anybody that can lose their salvation never had their salvation in the first place. Because what pays for our salvation? The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the finished work of Christ. You can't lose that if you truly have it. You can backslide, you can walk away from it, you can change your mind, but you can't get away from it if you truly belong to Christ. And here's the deal, if you truly belong to Christ, even if you backslide, you can't stay there for the rest of your life. Okay? So all those people that you know who used to go to church who will never darken the door of the church again, they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They had a relationship with the church and somebody peed in their cornflakes and made them mad and now they don't want any part of it. Okay? That makes sense to everybody? Can't blame it on God. God sent the perfect sacrifice to die for your sins. He did it exactly the way God wanted it to. The Bible tells us how we receive that. And the Bible tells us that if God calls us to that, we truly receive that, we can't lose it. Okay? So anybody that can walk away from God and never come back to God again never knew God in the first place. Never. Never had a relationship with God. They might have had a religious moment. They might have had a warm, fuzzy feeling. They might have been somebody who was trying to live a Christian life without being a believer. But they can't be a true follower of Christ and just walk away from it. Okay? Now, to become spiritually mature, that's the next thing. We become unified in the faith as we're growing in our spiritual maturity. We're reading God's Word. We're trying to understand it. Let me tell you, if you're reading God's Word, I don't care what translation it's in, it may be hard for you to understand. There are many, many tools available to find out what that means. And if you have a decent Bible, it's usually got either a column down the middle or a line across the bottom of third of the page, bottom third or quarter of the page, where there's a little bit of commentary and some things to help you find other scriptures so that you can understand what that means. But here's the problem. Words mean what they mean in the context in which they're found. Well, Terry and I found that out yesterday. Um, she's going to be old this week officially, so uh, she's having a birthday this week. And uh, we uh, took a ride up through Morgantown and we went to this store that, oh my gosh, you need a shoehorn to get in there. And you need grease on you to squeeze in between everything they got in the store. 
I took her there to show it to her because they got everything there from the baby fart to a cloud of thunder. I mean, if it's in the if it's in the realm, you can find it there. From candy to ice cream to hunting stuff to fishing stuff to foo foo things to sit around your house to to whatever you want. And uh, you know, on the way there, I said, "See that sign? It says hotspot." I said, "That's an internet place where you can gamble, and you have to be 21 to go in there." And I said, remember when you guys had a COVID school and you had to send kids home with the computer, what'd you give them to take home so they could get on the internet if they didn't have internet? Hotspot. What does the fireman chase down in a forest fire to make sure that it doesn't come up behind them again? A hotspot, right? So anybody who preaches and chases a word through the Bible, it doesn't mean the same thing in every situation because if you don't have the Greek and the Hebrew there to understand which form of the word they're using, it can mean something different. So you read the scripture in its context. Okay, you read it where it is. And then if you want to go look at something else to maybe try to get a little better handle on it, that's great. And you need to do that. That's part of spiritual maturity. Also, you have to measure up to the full standard of Christ. And in Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says that though he was God, he did not count that as something to hold on to. He set aside his divine privilege and became like us. He took on human flesh. Right? So if Jesus could set aside his divine privilege to become like us, to show us what it really means to look like a human being that God created in his own image, what's expected of us? To look like him, to be like him, to act like him, right? To be willing to do it God's way. What did Jesus say his food was when he was talking to the woman at the well? Does anybody know? They came and brought him a happy meal because they were, he was out there in the hot sun with that woman at the at the uh, well, and the disciples went to town, they got him a happy meal, came back, they were going to give him some lunch, and they said, Jesus, we brought you lunch. He said, listen, I have food to eat that you don't know. My food is to do the will of my Father. Think about that for a minute. How many of us are willing to go that far? We also have to stop acting like children. Most people who leave churches, most people who get in fights in churches are acting like little children. Somebody just needs to put them in time out for a while. Or they need a spanking. We've done that before here. We've done church discipline at least four times in the history of Cumberland Community Church where we tried to talk to them. One person tried to talk to them, then two or three tried to talk to them. Then we tried to get them to work with us as a church to work through whatever they were going on. And we finally had to do exactly what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18. We told them to go, don't come back, you're not longer welcome here, and we treat them like a tax collector or a penny. That's not happening in many churches in the world today. But you know, when you leave sin and root bitterness and all that kind of stuff in the church, it just works its way everywhere, doesn't it? And everybody comes affected by it. Um, Resist ungodly and false teaching. Winds and waves of doctrine. No Christian person should ever pick up a book that says, I died and went to heaven and read it. No Christian person should read The Shack. Anybody heard of The Shack? Garbage. It is absolute garbage. It has a lot of Christian sound and stuff in it, but it has nothing to do with salvation and what's required to be saved and all those kind of things. It's garbage. It's just nice, fluffy warm, ushy-gushy stuff. Okay? Yeah? Are you going to say something? Oh, okay. I thought you had something you were going to say. I've read that. I've read that book. I know. It's garbage. I know that. Jesus, God is not a fat black woman who's in the kitchen cooking for you. When I come to that, I quit reading it. I couldn't finish it. Like, and the Holy Spirit is not some crystalline prismatic force that's there that's there to help you. It's not. It's all paganism is what it is. Okay? Also, speak the truth in love. That's what I'm doing tonight. If you really love somebody, and I said it this morning, if you really love somebody, the nicest thing you can do to them is point out their sin and help them to understand based on what the Bible says, not on your opinion, not on what you think, but point it out based on what the Bible says that they're not okay. And you know what? When they're exposed to God's truth, they're responsible for God's truth. When they're exposed to your opinion, it's just your opinion. So that's again why you need to understand God's word. And to grow in every way to be more like Christ. That's a pretty broad term, isn't it? To grow in every way to be more like Christ. 
Well, let's look at Jesus. He was the only perfect human being besides Adam before and Eve before they sinned. But they sinned. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus is tempted in every way that we are, but he never sinned. Okay? And so if we're going to be like Christ, we can arrive at that place that Paul talks about where we're no longer slaves to sin and sin is no longer our master. Because we come to a place in our spiritual maturity where we learn what James says in chapter 1 when he says sin and temptation starts in your mind and then as you think on it too long it becomes action and then when it becomes an action it leads to sin and then that sin leads to death. We learn by our understanding of who God is and what God wants us to know that we we can say no to those things. You know, my dad was a diabetic in the later years of his life. And he was a character. I mean, he was a character. When he, after he came to Christ, after he quit being the Tasmanian devil, he became a character. And uh, he went to the doctor one day, and, and the doctor said, you're, you can going to take this insulin. You're not going to be able to eat pie and cake and cookies and all that kind of stuff. And he said, that's easy for you to say. He said, I can resist anything but temptation. But we can resist temptation, can't we? What he was telling that doctor was, you can say whatever you want to say. If I want a piece of pie, I'm going to eat it. If I want a cookie, I'm going to eat it. If somebody's got it around, I'm going to eat it. Right? <laughs> and so, as we think about it, we can resist temptation. We can find our way to a place where we're not sinning like we used to. And that's one of the first pictures of spirituality, or spiritual maturity, becoming more part of who we are, as we begin to conduct ourselves differently <coughs> than we are. But it's not based on our own efforts, it's based on our understanding of what God wants, and our understanding of Scripture, and knowing what's expected of us, and praying and asking God for the strength to be able to do that. Okay? It's proactive, there's determination there. God doesn't force anybody to grow up spiritually. He doesn't. And you know, it's a sad thing because in our world today, nobody's forcing our kids to grow up in common sense or making good decisions and stuff like that. And that's why our world's in the shape it's in. You know, if you listen to Al Gore and believe him this week, the, oil, the oceans are literally boiling. The polar ice caps are both melted and gone. All the polar bears have drowned. And we're watching the sea level come up over the, the levees, and the United States and all the rest of the world is flooded. But if you look out the window, and you look around, and you find a picture, and you take, because they got cameras everywhere, you can go on Google Earth and see every part of the world. He's lying. But how many people are buying into the lie because they won't hear the truth? And you see, that's the thing that's always intrigued me as a believer in Christ. People are more willing to believe lies about Christianity and lies about God and lies about the Bible than they are willing to open their minds up to the truth of what it says and what it's all about. Why is that? Because the heart of man is exceedingly wicked and no one knows the depths of that wickedness. It says that in Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 9. And also, the, the Bible says, as we read this morning in 1 Corinthians, there's none righteous, no, not one. Not one who doesn't have Jesus Christ in their life. And when sin is there, sin never never did what God wanted it to do, ever. That's why it's called sin. It's called missing the mark. Alright, let's finish up here. Uh, verse 16, when discipleship leads um, spiritual maturity, to the spiritual maturity there's evidence. There's evidence of somebody who's spiritually mature. Okay? You can sit back and look at somebody's life the whole time you know them and see if they're maturing in their walk with God. But Pastor Ron, you're not supposed to judge anybody. Well, yeah, the Bible says you'll know them by the fruits of their life. You'll know them by what they do, by what they say, by where they go, by how they act. You'll know who they are, whether they truly belong to God or whether they don't. And somebody who truly belongs to God can't live like everybody else in the world all the time. They can't. It's not possible. Um... With God's guidance, each person in the church body finds their place of service. Remember, we went through the spiritual gifts in the one Bible study, and we talked about tongues, and we talked about all the other gifts, and there's three or four places in the New Testament where it talks about the spiritual gifts that God gives the church so that we can be healthy, and we can be growing, and we can be vibrant like God wants us to be. 
Uh, and if you come to be a member of this church, you have to take a spiritual gifts inventory so you know what your spiritual giftedness is. So we try to find a place to get you plugged in. As each person works for Christ, others are encouraged to grow because, just like the song, I always feel like somebody's watching me. Remember that song from the 80s or late early 90s? You know? Somebody's always watching you, whether it's your kids, whether it's your kids, whether it's your neighbors, whether it's the people you work with, whether it's the people you do activities with, somebody's watching you to see if you truly are who you say you are. And if they see this in you, then they want to know, what makes you different from everybody else? Why aren't you, why aren't you like everybody else? What's going on? Tell me about it. Okay? And then the result is a healthy, loving, growing body of believers when people are moving towards spiritual maturity. So when you embrace spiritual maturity, it ceases to be all about you. And it becomes us, we, together, working for God's glory, for God's kingdom. Um, and, you know, we, we, we are not here to compare ourselves to each other. We're here to compare ourselves to Christ. He's, and, you know, another thing, look in the mirror and see who's looking back at you. And just evaluate who that person is that's looking back at you. Is that person... Knowing Scripture because they read it, study, memorize it. Do they know what's expected of them in the church body and in their walk with Christ? Does that person who's looking back at you in the mirror have actions, behavior, or their reactions and a willingness to do it God's way, or is some work tweak needs to be done in here? You know what? If you're looking at that person in the mirror and they don't know Scripture, you have the control to tell them what to do. Don't you? If you look in the mirror and they don't know what's expected of them, you can shake them a little bit and say, oh, yes, you do. You've heard it before. Just start doing it. If somebody's actions is looking back at you in the mirror and doesn't have a willingness to do it God's way, just put them in a the corner for a while. Make them have time out and say, when you start doing it God's way, you come out of the corner. Do they understand or do they want understanding? Are they seeking understanding? Never satisfied. Me and God are good. The first time that you say that, you're not. Does that make sense? Because what that is, is you just put yourself in God's place and said, I've done everything I need to do to please God. No. No, you haven't. Sacrifice. Terry and I drove by on the mechanic street on the way to pick Royal to come to church this morning. There's a new bank there where Standard Bank used to be called Dollar Bank. I said, every church should put that on top of their building, Dollar Bank. Because most of the dollars in the world go to the church. George and Abe, and once in a while, Alexander Hamilton go. But Jefferson and Grant and Benjamin Franklin, they don't get there very often. So let's call the church Dollar Bank. Right? Specifically, just kind of joking along. But we don't know what sacrifice is. We really don't. Because we're all tied up in our own lives. And we just give bits and pieces of whatever we have for leftovers and scraps to to whatever God wants or whatever somebody else needs, which means we really don't practice servanthood. If you're truly a servant of God, you want to help people. You want to. And you know, sadly, when you want to, sometimes they don't want you to. So what do you do? You pray for them, if nothing else. And you find somebody else to help. That makes sense to everybody? Okay, let's start with the first one here. Get your paper out. I'm going to give you four statements. I want you to write them down. When you read scripture, this is something that will help you in the process of understanding it. You can ask these four questions. What promise is there to claim? What promise is there to claim? Well, not every scripture claims a promise. So, the next one is, what example is there to follow? What promise is there to claim? What example is there to follow? Everybody got those two? What promise is there to claim? What example is there to be followed? What behavior is there to be addressed? What behavior is there to be addressed? Or, if it doesn't talk about a promise, 
and it doesn't talk about an example, and it doesn't necessarily talk about a behavior, it might ask this question, you might ask this question, what command removes sin from my life? What command removes sin from my life? Now that's just a little bit of something for you to start with. If you don't have a reading program that you're actually doing in the Scripture, I do not, do not, do not recommend that you start in Genesis and just try to read through the whole Bible. I don't. Because like I said this morning, you're going to get numbers, Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy, and then you're going to go, ah! There's a reason why that book's called Numbers. It's list after list after list after list after list. Okay? Here's what I recommend. If you're not a Bible reader or a strong Bible reader, start with the Gospel of John. Because you see the pre-existent Jesus, the humanity of Jesus, and the passion of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, which is the most important thing for us. And then read the Psalms. Just read through the Psalms. Once you finish John and the Psalms, pick another book and sit down and read it. You know, people ask me all the time, how can you take a four-chapter book and make 12 sermons out of it? Well, listen, I started out with one verse that we started with this morning. Romans 1.18, we're going to have five sermons out of one verse tied up with the rest of it that's there. Because you can't absorb everything in God's Word, even in a small passage, and just reading it and not doing anything with it. Okay? Because, this I'll give you this we're going to talk about next week. If you just hear something, you're lucky if you can remember 50% of what you hear. If you hear it, and you see it, you might be able to retain somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of it. If you see it, you hear it, and you write it down, you can retain up to 85 percent. If you see it, hear it, write it down, and memorize it, you can retain up to 100 percent of it. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. That's part of spiritual maturity. It's the work we're willing to do, right? So when you're reading God's Word, you need to have a book there, a little notebook or something. If you have a question, write it down. If you can't find the answer to that question, I'm a lifeline. Right? I was reading the scripture the other day and I was struggling with it. Can you help me understand it? Now, you got to tell me, do you want the Reader's Digest version or do you want the Round Robin Hood's Barn that helps you understand everything? Okay? Because I'm not usually the Reader's Digest abbreviated version on anything. Because I want you to have a complete rounded understanding of stuff. But I'll try to help you out. Any questions? All right. Next week, be prepared to talk because I'm going to ask you some more questions. I'm going to ask you something else that has to do with spiritual maturity. Okay? It may be something we talked about tonight. It may be something brand new. We just don't know. That's what keeps it exciting. If you always know what it's going to be, you don't. You know, it's like one of the Sunday school class where the Sunday school teacher stands there with the with the the, the book and. Okay, we're done. Who wants to go back to that Sunday school class? Not this kid, right? It needs to be exciting. And I'm going to tell you what, Jesus died for us, and that's the most exciting thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. And we need to rejoice in it. We need to celebrate it. We need to share it. We need to know it. We need to understand it. We need to help other people see why it's important to us so that they can have it in their lives too. All right? Well, let's pray, and then we'll be finished. Father God, we thank you for this time together. Lord, I thank you for everybody that's come out tonight. I thank you for their willingness to hear. And God, I'm going to pray this right now. I pray that everybody will go home and look in the mirror and ask these questions of themselves that are on this board. I pray that everybody will look inside their own hearts and their minds to see where they stand in their walk with you. Because God, you and they are the only ones who know. And it would be terrible for us to ask, where are you walking with God? Because some people really probably couldn't even put words to it. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in all of our lives this week that we would go and see, are we truly embracing spiritual maturity? Have we just kind of decided that we're okay? Where are we in the process? Is reading the Bible important? Is prayer important? Is sacrifice important? Is understanding important? Is being more like Christ more important? And Lord, we're, we've already given many, many examples tonight of how these things work and how they apply to our lives. And I pray that you would be glorified in our lives. I pray that you would give us hunger and thirst for your righteousness that can't be quenched except finding your righteousness, Father. And I pray that as we go along, that we wouldn't go by ourselves, that we would bring somebody along with us we would help them understand and help them see how grateful we are for what an amazing God you are. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.